Hello everyone, thanks for joining these sections. Um, my name is Tommy, I'm a senior software developer at IBM, and I also have my colleague, uh, Animesh uh, Stein. He's like um, a lead for a lot of our open source project and driven a lot of open source um, project in our teams. Unfortunately, Animesh cannot uh, join in today's session, so I'm going to present it by myself. And today we're going to go over how to bring you know, ML Pro on the Heritage Model uh, Cloud Native Machine Learning Platform by using intermediate representations. So to begin with, uh, we want to start with like how enterprise is actually you know using AI and ML pipelines in their productions. So in our research, we kind of see that like a lot of enterprise they are still struggling you know putting AI in terms of like production stage. Many of the teams still like have um, issues just like making sure like, AI is to run in like a test stage and have difficulty to move in productions. And when an enterprise kind of see how AI and machine learning works, right? They kind of see in these three aspects where they see data scientists and data engineers like kind of collect data and use data to build, and they use those data to build models. And finally, some that model will be able to do some prediction and you know create like business values. However, in reality, when you actually build a machine learning pipelines, it actually involves much more steps. So even in terms of data preparation, you have to involve like data cleansing, ingesting, analysis, transformation, validation, and splitting. Same thing with like model training, you have to optimize them and you know train in scales. And finally, when you deploy them, you have to also deploy them, you know, on different environments like such as edge, cloud environments, and you know, collect feedbacks and improve over time. So you can see this process is actually very iterative and involve like cross team efforts where multiple team have to work on multiple you know aspects of the machine learning pipelines. So having a you know a platform to share those you know different kind of um, data processing and model creations is very useful. So because of that, uh, we kind of in, uh, investigate like what kind of open source technology is good, and we found like GitHub pipeline is very good on you know running machine learning platforms on top of Kubernetes. And for GitHub pipelines, right, it's a very good platform that help you know, containerize um, ML tasks. So you could use any frameworks, any language inside your containerized uh, workflows, and you could also leverage Kubernetes like um, um, objects such as like uh, volume and secrets. And on top of that, data scientists is very easy to use this platform because it, it has a, a Python DSL, so you could actually create a workflows just using a Python's um, definitions. And because it's actually implements, you know, inside like a Python definition, you actually modify the input parameters. So whenever you actually run this pipeline using a different kind of parameter, you can also do so. And once you have created these automated, you know, pipelines, you can also schedule them and run them on your day-to-day -day, uh, basis to automate your machine learning workflows. And now let's go ahead and talk about like some of the big advantage of using your um, Kubeflow pipelines. One of the big advantages is using like, the Python SDK. As you can see, we're using the Python SDK. Data scientists is very easy to able to create like a um, machine learning workflow by just using like a programmatic um, syntax. As as you can see, you could just define different tasks and have like dependencies on them, and create this pipeline that both have like sequential dependencies as as well as like parallel uh, runtime as well. And behind the scenes, once you create these pipelines, there's like multiple you know like workflow engine able to run these pipelines. By default, um, Githo pipeline use what the, what they call like uh, algo workflows. It's actually a you know um, Kubernetes um, container native workflows that runs uh, parallel jobs. And behind the scenes, wh whatever components you define on Githo pipelines uh, on algo, generally you actually just run them as a part. And within a part, right, like you have have multiple containers that you know ca capture like all the workflows, capture all the artifacts, and able to push them. And in our teams, we see like um, Argo have some limitation at the time. We cannot run them on top of OpenShift and cannot run them as security. So we actually introduced like, um, another you know, runtime to just uh, run on um, behind like, uh, Githo pipelines. Um, so when we investigate, uh, Tactile is a very good platform that able to you know, certify by OpenShift and have good OpenShift support. And behind the scene, uh, Tactile also uses similar syntax where we could also like, wrap a components in Q4 um, pipelines inside like a uh, part inside Tectons. So in Tecton, uh, there's similar concepts where you know a pipeline is also you know defined as a workflow on Q4 pipelines, and a task is actually run as a part usually, and is corresponding to like a component in Q4 pipelines. And with this, uh, we kind of leverage Tecton behind the scenes, and um, we hit like 1.0 go, where we're able to um, modify the um, Python SDK 
to generate you know a Python a Python specific YAML, Python specific definitions, and then you know submit it on the uh, Gitpod pipelines API engine, and then use that as your um, runtime to um, truth a uh, source of truth. And behind the scenes, when we have like um, the Tecton pipeline defines, the Tecton just able to leverage and then run as exactly what uh, how you know uh, Gitpod pipeline run on Argos. And with this, we have completed the basic uh, implementation. Now we want to leverage, you know, additional like um, features for it, for Kipo pipelines. And some of the you know nice feature on Kipo pipelines that you know Argo and Tecton didn't provide is metadata and artifact tracking. So for metadata and artifact tracking, like one of the you know main benefit of them is like once you have metadata and artifacts know like how they've been used and how they've been consumed, you could easily use them to find out like what you know. Um, the which data a model was trained on, so you could actually go back and check your version of the data, and you could also compare previous model runs. So when you actually modify, like let's say hyperparameter, you could easily compare them you know, between two different runs, and you could uh, whenever you actually have like multiple stage from the previous model, you could also track them on which state you have been used, and then we use you know, any previous you know computer outputs. So let's say you have trained a model for a long time, you want to reuse those results when you run. A new pipelines um, with just different kind of tweak on the um, the way you want to consume that models. And on Q4 pipelines, right, uh, artifact tracking is just simply uh, able to see like which uh, object you have been consumed for the artifacts and like, which uh, uh, components producing the artifacts, and you can see that the versions and different uh, time stamps that uh, is uh, being consumed and produced. And with those information, you could actually create this lineage tracking where you could see, oh, this component is actually producing this artifacts at uh, this timestamp. So uh, the next stage, you could see like the next next component is consuming the same uh, artifacts, um, right? And and if you have multiple kind of components, you consuming the same artifact, you could actually use this lineage tracking and see uh, what are the dependencies that is not just on the parameter levels, but on like an actual artifact uh, object levels. And with this, we also like make sure like Tecton also support all these functions. So um, we actually um, implement Tecton in a way that able to reproduce exactly the same uh, functionality as you know Gitpod pipeline on Argos. So in Tecton, you would even do the Tecton back, and you could also view the loss using the Linux tracking and artifact tracking uh, seamlessly, um, and the user experience is exactly the same. And the way we actually did this is actually um, we have to modify, you know, the Tecton um, comp uh, compilations that are actually able to produce artifacts the same way as Argo, and we have to work with the Tecton community to actually produce, you know, multiple features that are able to like um, compliance with the exact functionality on on, on Argo. And then, um, in addition to that, we have to uh, create like a new way of tracking metadata because um, the way on how Gitpod pipeline tracking metadata on Argo is very different from Tecton. So in this case, we have to like, recreate um, a new concept of like metadata for Tecton as well, and able to have to create like this new metadata writer to track uh, all those metadata, and we produce them on Gitpod pipelines. And because of this, you could kind of see like um, to support just like a new um, runtime like Tecton on Gitpod pipeline, we have to first modify the SDK to produce a new source of YAML. And they have to update the, both the UI and server to able to consume this new, you know, like YAML definitions. And behind the scenes, like because Tecton runs tech pipeline differently from Argos, we have to have to like modify how you know Tecton is uh, running the pipeline, and also have to modify how metadata is being tracked and consumed with you know the new Tecton structure. And with all these efforts, it's very difficult for like any particular user to add you know new backend if they want to. Um, so that's why we want to like introduce the V2, and in addition to that, uh, we also see like other use cases. Uh, let's say for TensorFlow Extended, um, TensorFlow Extended is very you know driven by metadata, and it needs you know metadata to be like strong, cons uh, consistent, and because of the V1 implementation, uh, metadata is actually like sync synchronously. So for TensorFlow Extended use case, um, they actually have to you know produce uh, the metadata as um, part of the component itself, so it's actually not ideal. So that's why um, with this kind of like scenario, let's go ahead and introduce like what Q4 Pipeline V2 have provide and what are the benefits of Q4 Pipeline V2s. So the main you know objective of you know Q4 Pipeline V2 is actually to architect the pipeline compilations 
So we actually want to build a pipeline that is mainly, you know, support for metadata and driven by metadata. And secondly, we would have like um, this new V2 uh, give a pipeline data to be uh, back, back, uh, backend platform agnostics. So anyone want to extend a new backend, they don't have to like, change too much client, too much server works. And, um, and in, addition, in addition to that, like give a pipeline could actually either have more control on how the runtime is being working. Because right now, like a lot of the feature, let's say like artifacts, right, um, is actually very dependent on the underlying, you know, runtimes. So whenever it's a new um, platform is being introduced, they have to support all these features. So V2 is aimed to actually reduce the amount of feature dependent on the backend and have give a pipeline to handle all this kind of like metadata tracking and artifacts producing, right, just on the Gifford pipelines platforms. So let's rewind a little bit on like what you know, like metadata in V1 of Q4 pipeline is doing. So in V1, right, um, all the metadata is actually tracked by um, a service called MLMD uh, metadata writers. And of course, there's some exception where you could actually use uh, MLMD client to write to the service as well. But most of the time, um, the metadata writer is actually just asynchronously collects all the parts and collect all those metadata and write them into the MLMD server. So all the data, metadata is being tracked. However, with this approach, because it is synchronously, it doesn't have like a strong consistency. So for TensorFlow Extended, they cannot use this approach. And furthermore, because this approach is actually just watching all the part events and all the part annotation to capture all those metadata. Um, when you want to have like a new feature, let's say I'll go into the new feature uh, for HTTP templates and Tecton Query, like custom task controller that runs task like not inside a part, you cannot use the same approach to collect metadata. So um, this is the disadvantage that we cannot leverage a new feature from this like backend provider as well. So this is why we kind of move into metadata um, in a new versions where we want to have like MMD integrated as part of the you know pipeline execution. So as part of running the components, we actually have um, capability to read and write metadata as part of running uh, workflow. So it's actually able to run uh, synchronously. So for uh, TensorFlow extended use case, it actually could rely them, um, rely those metadata to driven uh, when the artifact is being used and when the consumer it also is consistent at that time of point. Um, and furthermore, because we could actually have like strong consistency with this approach, we actually could also use this for caching as well. So we we see like um, the metadata is actually being produced and is consistent at that timestamp. We could just say, oh, we, we already we produced this um, artifacts at this time and it's still the same version and it's strong consistent. Um, so we could actually just use it as a as cache key and then not have to produce, uh, not to compute the main you know, executions. So it could actually improve the execution runtime uh, significantly with this approach. And as part of the, the, the V2, we also want to like, um, optimize how we you know consume the pipeline specs. So in in V one pipeline spec is actually like based on the backend you know YAML. So when you have like an Argo or like a Tecton backend, you actually use to use their definitions as a source of truth. And because we, we use like a backend specific source uh, source of truth, right? So whenever you have to uh, consume them in the SDK in a client, or you bring in your own engines or bring in your own you know interface you have to have like uh, interpreter to understand all these new specs. So um, the challenge is like when you have to introduce a new backend, right, for Kipo pipeline, you have to change a lot of the, um, let's say UI backend, SDK, and uh, uh, all, all these services right over here. And with V2s, what we aim is to create these intermediate representations. So uh, all the interaction between Q4 pipeline platform is actually using this new, you know, IRs, what we call IR intermediate representations. And we only, you know, communicate specific with the orchestration engine specs uh, on one of those backends uh, when we need to, you know, create an object or patch an object. So, um, so we actually reduce, you know, the code you need to, you know, uh, modify uh, for new platforms into a, a single package uh, for one backend. And the benefit of this is that like, um, because of this approach in V2s, um, we could able to create a new UX that is purely based on the information from MLND and from the spec on this uh, new uh, intermediate representations, right? So with this you know, new approach, um, the new metadata able to collect you know, more information such as you know, artifacts, subtext, and lineage. 
able to display them all in the same UI. And because at the same time, it's using like a common intermediate representation. So whenever a backend needs to be updated for a new version, or you have to introduce a new backend, this UI you don't have to change, right? Like it, it will just consume this exact same information, no matter what kind of uh, backend and um, version of the uh, uh, execution engine you are using. And another benefit of you know using intermediate representation is that we actually have like one common way to communicate between Q4 pipelines and the clients. So um, in Q4 pipeline we have you know the SDK and the UI. But if let's say um, any you know cloud provider want to provide a new way, a new interface, right, that consume these platforms, let's say they provide a new way that introduce like local, no code, you know, um, interaction UI, they could easily just like based on this new IR and don't have to really worry about what kind of like uh, runtime is using behind the scenes. As like in the previous version, when you actually want to introduce this kind of feature, you have to know, oh, you want to run the open shift. Um, and it's only certified by uh, like, uh, for Tecton. They have to like have a interpreter just particularly, particularly for Tectons. And if someone is using Argo, you have to create interpreter just like, specifically for Argo. And it's very difficult to maintain when someone wants to introduce a new interface in, in, the, in the old EU1 versions. And it, with the V2s, right, when we actually run this task, we had kind of mentioned like, uh, as part of running this task, we actually record you know, all this metadata as part of running it. And the concept we're using it here is actually based on you know, TensorFlow Extended, um, the concept of driver, executor, and publishers. So whenever a, you know, a component is being run, we will have a concept of driver where it actually collects all the um, metadata information and try to see is this, you know, um, Task is being executed or not? Do we need to cache them? Do we need to like, uh, f you know, run them into a new, you know, architects, right? Um, and once those, you know, context information is being set, the main execution finish, and then we have the like, concept publisher where all the other facts and parameters is being recorded and pushed back to the metadata service. So all the, you know, information is like, strong, consistent in this in this case, and any pipeline is depending on, you know, this artifact information, they could actually ensure like uh, there will be no like uh, delay or no modification that it will be coming from different pipelines. And because of this, right, um, this enhancement we could actually do with like components itself as well. So because we introduced a new um, intermediate representations, um, this representation is actually pl very pluggable by just like swapping individual components. So uh, in V2, it's, it's very easy for you to use the SDK to actually compile your code into a component representation right, in YAML or JSON. And in addition to that, in open source, um, we also have another project called Machine Learning Exchange. Uh, and also Google Cloud have provided like, a new service that able to like, register components. So anyone that wants to you know, just pull the components from a, uh, a public host, they could do so. Um, and whenever you know, someone wants to introduce you know, a let's say a local no code interface, they could you know, easily rely on this registry to actually just pull code on uh, pull, you know, new components right, from a proper endpoint. And they don't have to just you know, copy paste code right, and, and uh, put on top of their own interface. And lastly, when we actually see like, um, we have this intermediate representation, but like in the back end, we still have like, a lot of code you know, spamming around different kind of um, Microservice and they are all using like a specific like um, specs for um, the execution runtimes. So this is why we need to have an abstraction layers. So we create an abstraction interface. They're able to understand you know both the um, spec from Argos, Tecton, and any you know future interface that will be coming um, for the Q4 pipeline platforms. So behind the scenes. Um, with this abstraction, the benefit is that like in V1, because we don't have these abstractions, all the um, source of truth is based on, you know, like the workflow specs, right, and the uh, parameter spec for Argo and Tecton. And whenever you have to, um, you know, modify a version, or let's say um, Argo have to, you know, in, uh, upgrade to like a V3 version with like major, you know, uh, spec change, you have to change like every single point where the metadata consumes that spec. So it's very difficult to track down and, Everything is all over the place, right? All over different packages. You have, you have to know the code very well to, in order to upgrade like Argo or switch to a different backend. And with V2s, um, because everything is, you know, on top of Kubernetes pipeline is communicated by an intermediate representation, SDK and frontend have no change need to be done. 
and on the backend level, we actually abstract everything, all, all the backend specific um, specs into a one common package. So whenever you need to upgrade a Tectons or Argo versions, or you have to modify any specs, you only have to modify in one single place. And this package will be able to like uh, abstract and, and able to like um, um, able to consume and inherit um, to the all the um, pipeline services. So when all the pipeline services use them, uh, they don't have to be aware like what is uh, running behind the scenes. Like only the um, spec implementer have to make sure like this is um, compatible to run whatever version is being deployed. And the major feature of abstracted layer is how to break down into three parts. So one, obviously we have the compiler. So whenever you bring in like intermediate representat representation, I would want to like apply that representation on a uh, backend spec. You need to you know kind of compile them into that um, specification so it could be understand by that um, uh, backend APIs. And on top of that, we have execution time. So when you have these specs being compiled, you need a client right to run the basic you know, API operations, so create, get, patch, delete this. And last but not least, when you have this uh, new spec and this spec is being running and you need to create some patch, have to modify uh, certain attribute, you want to have like an object layer where you only want to like, let's say you want to update um, the uh, uh, service account right on that particular pipeline. Um, you could just use this abstracted you know, execution spec to say update um, um, service, uh, Service name and and behind the scenes, right? Uh, whatever uh, so, um, service name had to be updated for that backend implementation is uh, determined by the execution spec and depending by the runtime you are uh, running it. And now we kind of go into like the details on what you know the execution client can be uh, is supporting. So the execution client support you know the you know the basic. Um, um, CR, uh, CRUD uh, executions to, to create updates, delete, get list patch. So this is like common, you know, Kubernetes um, um, actions. And you and because of this, we abstract all these actions right um, for this in within this interface. So um, in theory, even though you don't have like a Kubernetes based runtimes, you could still implement all these actions um, and use that as a Kubernetes pipeline backend. So we actually from the M four and having a uh, backend that's really non kubernetes based and able to use Kubernetes pipeline as well. So that's also one of the motivation to have these abstraction layers. And by just like, able to create and patch um, with the clients, uh, it's not enough. We still need like a, a various you know, common function that um, whenever you need to, let's say, update a um, default, let's say, input parameters, we want to update like um, certain information, let's say annotation or labels right, on that particular um, pipelines, right? We need uh, uh, to know how to actually do this for a particular backend. So we have abstracted all this common function into this uh, new abstraction interface. So um, because when you actually want a pipeline, or let's say when you want to retry a pipeline, uh, you only need to modify a certain set of parameters. And uh, let's say you only need to like, update parameters. Um, this is, uh, so the pipeline service only needs to call like, update parameters. And the execution spec will actually determine what backend is using and update the uh, pipeline parameters based on you know, the, uh, the backend engines is being specified um, on these platforms. So uh, with this, well, I could just kind of show you like how um, you know, the Q4 pipeline v2 is um, being used. And you can see in the UI, um, there's no dependency and you don't have to, uh, understand, you have to be aware what kind of backend engine is being used. So in you know, the Q4 pipeline v2s, uh, when we actually you know, click on a pipeline, uh, let me uh, make it larger. You could see like all these components, right? It's being rendered and then uh, being e extracted from a pipeline specs. And this is the new pipeline specs uh, where we have defined uh, as a intermediate rep representations. It's very you know driven by component base. You could see like each component is being defined nicely over here, so it's easy to you know plug and uh, plug in and then extract and able to upload and register on a uh, common registry. And once we run them, right? Uh, because it, this pipeline takes some time to run, so I actually ran this beforehand. Uh, once you actually ran them, um, you could see all this information is able to fetch uh, fairly fast, and this is all based on one, you know, common pipeline specs. So you could see, like, um, no matter what kind of backend you use, whether Argo or Tectons, 
Uh, the UI doesn't care because like, all those information is actually stored in the metadata server. And the metadata servers share the common kind of like metadata definitions, no, no matter what kind of backend you use and uh, what kind of execution you use. Um, it will always use the same you know, pipeline specs and the metadata information to render this UI. So you don't have to need to worry about like, testing and updating you know, the UI based on a new, let's say, backend you have introduced. So, um, so I just want to like, have a summary. Um, so in, in this section, we kind of got uh, emphasize on how we want to embrace you know, metadata as like the, the first step towards the like, ML ops. So all this kind of like information that driven by each individual components will be actually focused on the metadata. So um, it would be kind of like uh, back end agnostic and everything could be kind of like viewed as metadata and they don't have to be modified based on whatever runtime you have used. And in addition to that, uh, we want to uh, emphasize on the new concept of IR and able to make sure this IR is uh, component-based so it's easy to register and consume them um, in this new um, ML platforms, right? Uh, when the new provider want to consume them and create, let's say, a local-local interface, it's easy to um, make it pluggable and, and consume them very easily. And lastly, we want to um, show like, how a um, abstracted layer could be actually help uh, introducing new orchestration engine very easily. And this, you know, new abstraction layer is actually available in, you know, um, the V2 Alpha 4 release. So you, when you want to, like, in, bring in a new client, bring a new, you know, backend execution, you could easily just use this version and extend uh, Q4 Pipeline to run on your own platforms. And lastly, these are the reference for, for Q4 Pipelines and Q4 Pipeline Tectons. If you're interested in using, using uh, Q4 Pipeline on different backend, you could Go to this link, and we also have a B two design docs to show like how, um, in details those metadata is being used and how those metadata is being produced, right? Um, and and the, dis the design concept behind the scene using the V two design docs over here. And that concludes the end of the section. Thank you very much for um, joining. Um, is there any question in the room? Yes, please. Um, so let me repeat the question. So you are asking, is there any like uh, computation optimization for this IR, right? Yeah. Um, so this IR is um, you know kind of optimized to be like pluggable. So um, all the components easy to kind of swap in and swap out. Um, when you kind of emphasize on like um, performance uh, optimization, are you kind of emphasize on like the runtime performance, or you emphasize on the compilation of performance? Oh, I see. Yeah, so, I, I mean, in OpenVINO IR, it's just some um, um, optimization to make the throughput better and to make the, uh, 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 for example, the commutation cost uh, uh, fewer. So, I, 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 I'm wondering if there's any uh, similarity in this part. Um, right, so in in the new IR, right, like it actually abstracted a lot of the, you know, concepts, right, that just you know, purely driven by uh, able to like offset to purely to the Q4 pipeline platforms. Um, so you you just want to asking like how you could optimize you know performance on a uh, on like a uh, runtime like pipeline runtime. You could kind of see uh, this kind of new concept where we introduce um, uh, the way we record uh, metadata using driver and publishers. So before that, right, we we actually have to rely on other services to you know just capture them asynchronously, so it's difficult to scale them when you have a lot of pipelines. And with this new kind of like um, um, pipeline constructions, we, you, we leverage the concept of driver and publishers. Uh, this, driver, uh, this driver is actually just um, a concept to you know, get metadata and then you know, send them to the executor and the publisher, right? So uh, in the Argo community, they have a concept called ACT template, and in Tecton, they have a new concept called uh, custom task controller. Where we leverage those concepts, right? Uh, we actually have some experiment um, implementation for that as well. You don't have to run, you know, this task as a container. You could actually run them just as a request, right, to like um, a server. So that 
that server could be responsible for you know um, getting you the metadata and make sure that everything is consistent and you don't you, you could just scale much easier um, by just relying um, on, on this new concept rather than you have to manage your own you know met, uh, metadata writer service and manage your own let's say caching server to cache your own uh, components as well so that's kind of like the benefit on um, you have more control on how you could optimize um, and scale on your own services. Yeah, thanks. Is there any other question in the room? Um, is there any question uh, online? Um, yeah, is that, if that's okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Um, and this is the end of the session. Thank you.